we hopefully are very excited to have some wonderful what we call exemplars of education um, ways that can integrate genetics and genomics into the curriculum. It will be a panel presentation, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about each of the speakers before we begin so that they can just keep flowing with um, their wonderful expertise that they can share with you. So as we mentioned earlier, there's a number of ways that you can provide education about genetics and genomics, and many people have tried different ways and have learned about the pros and cons of doing each of those. So you're going to hear some of those examples, and then as Kathy and I mentioned, next year we want to hear what has worked in your setting or what has not worked, and, and so we can learn from each other. But today we're going to have panelists Janet Williams. Janet, you want to wave at them? <laughs> Um, Dr. Janet Williams is the Kelting Professor of Nurser, Nursing and Director of the NINR RT32 funded Clinical Genetics Nursing Research Postdoc Fellowship at the University of Iowa. She also chairs the University of Iowa's Behavioral and Science IRB, and her research has been funded by NIH, HRSA, and private foundations looking at teen experiences, family management, genetic discrimination, and function of persons with Huntington's disease and also a lot about communication among families and healthcare providers about genetic testing. She recently served as a panel member on the NIH State of the Science Co Conference about family history. And if you haven't heard about that or you would like to learn more about that, go on to NIH.gov and look for the uh, State of the Science Conference Family History Report, which has just been um, drafted. She was very much a, uh, an intimate part of that discussion. Dr. Williams is also a member of the NINR Advisory Council, and her clinical background is in pediatric nursing and genetic counseling. And is, she has been a mainstay of genetics nursing for many, many con contributions in years. Thank you, Janet. <coughs> Janet will be sharing with you an integrated model of education. Then Lorraine Frazier. Lorraine, you want to share your hand? Lorraine Frazier, Dr. Frazier, is the distinguished Nancy Wil Wilerson. Thank you. Professor of Nursing at the University of Texas at Houston School of Nursing. Dr. Frazier is the principal investigator on our R01 protocol, Depressive Symptoms and Genetic Influences on Cardiac, Out Cardiac Outcomes, funded by NINR. And she is also the project director of TexGen Research, which supports multi-center, multi-institutional biobank development of clinical data and biological sampling for cardiovascular and cancer patients at the Texas Medical Center. She's also the director of the Center for Clinical and Translational Science Biobank at the University of Texas at Houston. Lorraine will be sharing with you um, an example of shared courseware that has been developed for advanced practice primarily, but also could be a model for things that you're thinking about in the baccalaureate setting. Dr. Judith Lewis, who you've heard from a little bit already. Dr. Lewis um, is a professor emerita. Merita. Excuse me. School of Nursing, Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Judy has been also a mainstay in genetics nursing, uh, representing us quite well on the Secretary's Advisory Commission for Genetics, Health, and Society. G what's the previous one? SACGT? SACGHS is the one that is also now on the website. So if you search for SACGHS, you can see where she and Agnes Masney and other nurses have made contributions to policy setting at the federal level. But that is a resource you might want to know about. Judy has 30 plus years of teaching in baccalaureate and higher degree programs, including Boston State College, University of Massachusetts in Boston, MGH Institute of Health Professions, and Virginia Commonwealth University. And I won't um, tell you about all of their publications and presentations, but if you looked up any of these people, you would find lots and lots of literature to share. Um, Judy has been kind enough to talk about a standalone course that is being offered in your setting, correct? Was. Was. Okay, so lessons learned from that. And then the last panel is, is Dr. Yvette Conley. Yvette is there also. Dr. Conley is an associate professor of nursing and human genetics at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, see what is different about Yvette is I tell you that she has a BA in biology, an MS in genetic counseling, and a PhD in human genetics. What's different? 
She's a doctor with a PhD, but not a nurse. But what Yvette is going to share with us is how valuable interdisciplinary resources can be to us. We're not in this alone. There are many, many, many disciplines going through the same thing we are and can learn from each other and can support each other. And Yvette has been um, amazing at that. She was the first geneticist in the country to hold a full-time primary appointment in a school of nursing and is devoted to educating nurses and nurse scientists. She's been involved with the Oncology Nursing Society um, Genetics Online Education Series and many of our professional organizations have resources for us to um, uh, get and utilize in our teaching as well. She has also been involved as administrative faculty for the NINR Summer Genetics Institute and is a co-director of the NIH training program titled Targeted Research and Academic Training of Nurses in Genomics. She also runs a fully equipped molecular genomics laboratory that conducts NIH-funded research on the contribution of genetic variation to patient outcomes. So I don't tell you all that just to say, you know, these are experts, because obviously I could have said that in one sentence, but I, they bring a wealth and a diverse um, experience that I, I think you'll gain from as you hear from their presentations. And then we will have some time for discussion so you can pick their brains about what might work in your area. There may be some examples of models of curriculum integration that we haven't thought of or that you're using, so feel free also in the discussion to share that so we learn from you as well. So Janet, I need to find your slides. Mm. And Kathy walked in. Are you in here? Maybe you're down here. Thank you. Syllabus. That would be too obvious, but thank you. <laughs> I should see Williams right under me. There we go. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Nine eight. No, this one. It must be that one. Yeah. And then I know it's down here. <coughs> Thank you, Janet. Thank you. It, it's exciting to be here. Um, been at this for a little while, and it's fun to talk with people who are interested in starting genetics in their uh, programs. So I'll try to talk about the practical things of what happened when we did this at Iowa, what was helpful, what maybe a couple things maybe weren't so helpful. and. Uh, I tried to make very detailed slides in case you have questions about the details of what various faculty are doing, and I'm happy to take your questions back to them uh, if you'd like further information. So we started this in the mid-1990s, myself and another faculty, so there were two of us, Deb Schutte and I, were very interested in genetics, myself from my clinical background and Deb from a uh, clinical and, and um, academic background. And so we were rather lucky in that that was the year we were doing curriculum change. So the, the, the curriculum was pretty open and there was a lot of work that needed to be done and we were eager workers. We were ready to come help, you know, solve those problems. We also were lucky in that we, so we started um, having a, a group that met and we thought of people that would be interested in this topic, but we included the, the program chairs and the deans. And we were just lucky that we did that because there was buy-in from those folks as well. They could see kind of uh, on into the future things that we hadn't thought about. For example, um, you'll see in 2001 we were awarded a T32 postdoctoral training fellowship. We certainly didn't have that on our plate, but it was part of the vision that the uh, administration had. So we had buy-in from the top down and from the bottom up kind of at the same time. What we did is we went through the curriculum. Deb and I identified areas where we thought genetics might fit the objectives of the existing courses. We, we went out and went door to door and talked to each faculty, said this is what we think might be useful to you. Would you be interested? If you'd like, we could give the guest lecture. We could provide information for you, whatever fits your needs. And so that's how we started it. What we have today is, uh, it's not the same uh, courses that we started with, but we are currently, um, I could identify genetics content in the following courses, and I'll just briefly go through uh, a little bit about what's going on in each of those courses. As I said, it needed, needed to fit the course objectives, whatever that faculty uh, needed to deliver as far as education. 
It uh, currently fits the new AACN essentials, and so we had information, we looked at the new essentials and, and could see a very nice fit for many of the things that we have ongoing. We also have an elective human genetics course that I mentioned to you. Our students can take electives. Um, I think maybe there's one slot for an elective in their baccalaureate program. And this elective is taught by Sandra Dackhirsch on our faculty. She's a genetic nurse and uh, nurse researcher. And she uh, has many years uh, experience in genetic counseling. So she teaches this course and it's to mainly upper level undergraduate students and some graduate students. And then we have students from across the country who are looking for an online human genetics course that is relevant to nursing and so that's been a very uh, successful uh, opportunity. We also have independent study available for our undergraduate students with genetic clinical or research faculty. I'm at a research intensive university so people who are on the tenure track also have research programs. We are in, a, in the um, place in our state where the tertiary care medical center is located so that's where the genetic program is and we have very good partners, very good friends in the genetic nursing and genetic counseling community and the nurse practitioner community, people who are working with patients with cystic fibrosis or people who are working in the hemophilia clinic. So we have a nice, um, we hope, array of places where students might get to have additional experiences. That has uh, been also very uh, exciting. It, it creates um, a certain amount of um, effort on the part of the faculty to help students identify what an independent study might be, but the, the rewards are exciting because of the interest of the students. One student that um, I mentored as an undergraduate was interested in uh, people with disabilities. And I said, well, I know we have a new Down syndrome clinic and I know that families over there have a lot of trouble accessing community services. How would it be if I set you up with a family with a toddler and I'll set you up with a family who have an adult with Down syndrome? And I think they're actually facing some of the similar issues but at very different places in the lifespan. Um, how to write the will to, to take care of this young woman when her parents were gone. How to access a preschool. What happened to this family when they wanted their daughter in gymnastics as compared to what's happening for this family now. So the families uh, were willing to do that and the student wrote a very nice paper and um, th this one stands out in my mind because she uh, learned much more than she thought she would learn about the issues that people face and what nurses could be doing to help people facing very similar problems. So I've set up the slides. I tried to make them fairly detailed. I'm not going to talk too much about what's on the slide. But I've tried to organize them according to the current AACN essentials. And Human Growth and Development is a course that we teach within our faculty, but it is in our pre-nursing um, kind of part of the program. And so I put it under uh, essential number one, uh, an element of liberal education. Sandy Dak Hirsch teaches this. We've uh, Oh, we've probably been through three or four faculty, very different people teaching this course, and human growth and development always contains things about genetics. So we've done various things. Uh, at the current time, these are the types of topics that are included in that course. And what Sandy does, in addition to lecture and um, you know the online resources, is that she uses a coin toss ex um, activity with students to illustrate the rel relevance of genomics, uh, genetic and environmental factors on a common trait where there's variability and it happens to be height. So that's the, the action activity that she's built into that course. That is also a terrific place to identify those students who are especially interested in genetics and it usually, uh, this is in our classroom of about 200 people. It's a course that people take to, to qualify to get into nursing so there's a high interest in doing well in this course because it's part of what's evaluated when people apply to the program. And there are always people who come up afterwards and say, I was really interested in what you said about cancer. I was really interested in what you said about um, nurses' careers. And so it's an excellent way to start um, building on that interest that students bring into the program and helping them see what kinds of experiences might be especially valuable, such as that elective in the independent study and some of the other options. Uh, pathophysiology uh, is taught by Sue Gardner and that also I grouped under Essential 1. These are the kinds of things that she includes in the pathophys course. Um, I have never contributed to this course. Um, usually the person who's teaching this is very well acquainted with genetics and um, 
builds in the content on their own. We have uh, acquired clicker technology, and so uh, she uses clickers to build in quizzes when she goes through a, a concept such as trans translation, or she goes through a concept about RNA, she'll embed some quizzes, and that would gives her a chance to get feedback from the students to find out how much of that did they grasp, what kinds of things does she need to, to pause and repeat. The basic concepts for nursing practice is taught by Martha Driesneck. Some of you might have met Martha if you went through the Summer Genetics Institute recently. Um, she calls this the new fundamentals, so those of us who learned on Mrs. Chase would, would know that some of that is, is now in this course. Uh, as she goes through the content in basic concepts, she it gives attention to human diversity and variation. So when she's talking about applying skills to patients, she talks about the individual. So she uses examples like a person who who has a factor V Leiden uh, allele and the issues for uh, birth control pills. She brings in pharmacogenetics as part of the stories and part of the content that she talks to, about with her students. It makes it a very ordinary part of nursing. It's, it's brought in at the entry level when they're just beginning to get their nursing theory and concepts. And as well, she brings in some things about nutrigenomics. I'm kind of jumping to the end of the curriculum here. Um, it just happened to fit, uh, fall into my slide sequence at this point. Leadership is what I'm calling the course kind of at the end of the uh, curriculum, and that's where much of our ethics content can be found. We have an online continuing education uh, program that, you, that you'll hear about a little bit later, and within that there are some case studies that we developed through some funding through the LC uh, program. We hired actors from our summer um, uh, theater program and uh, students in the fine arts program to take the roles of family members. Um, Kathy Calzone is in this. Uh, she didn't act as anybody except herself in illustrating how to obtain an uh, informed consent. But students in the leadership course can go online. They can click on one of these case studies. The case studies are built around an ethical dilemma. So there are various uh, components in the cases. There's the mother. There's the father. There's the children. There's the nurse. There might be um, the brother and the sister, and there might be the pastor or whatever goes into that story. The stories are built so there's no resolution. There's no one resolution that will satisfy everybody. The ethics committee at the hospital may not be satisfied. The, the partner may not be satisfied. The, the teenager in the family might be the person that's not satisfied. Anyway, these are the ethical dilemmas um, that are illustrated in some of these cases. We have written up questions for students to answer after they view the case. It's on their own, you know, it's when they go on the course site and choose a case, look at it. Go through the exercise, answer the questions, turn those in to Howard Butcher, the uh, course director, and that's then he grades it. It's like a quiz. And he has also used some of that information in building uh, short answer questions on his exam. So ethics is part of uh, all of our curricula. We choose to use uh, some clinical examples that re revolve around current clinical situations involving genetics and genetic testing. Um, there are things uh, that come out of Essential 5 and Essential 6 that, that are uh, part of the content that we deliver. It's, it's not really a lecture uh, by itself, but whenever I'm talking with undergraduate students, I'm mentioning things about disparities in healthcare, especially in the areas that I know something about, which is access to, gen to genetic testing, uh, genetic literacy, the ways that family members might share information with each other. And so I'm going to give you an example in, in a little bit about how I bring that in to um, a class that I give uh, in our communications course. We also then also bring up information about referrals and communication with um, healthcare resources. If nurses are going to practice in the state of Iowa, I tell them about the regional genetic clinics, about how people can receive healthcare, genetic healthcare through specialty services in Iowa. I talk to them about newborn screening and how each state will uh, implement that in a little different way and tell them, remind them how to find that information if they, many of them do move out of the state. Um, Nurses who um, become educated in Iowa really like to go see the mountains for a little while in Colorado, and so often they're going off and then they'll come back to Iowa, many of them, when they um, get along a little later in their careers. So these kinds of concepts appear in the, the uh, information that we bring to students, but it isn't under necessarily a genetics umbrella. It is not necessarily labeled as such in the course, but it is um, illustrated in the examples and the content that we give. 
Essential 7 is where uh, you'll find the information about assessment, a family history assessment, how to conduct a health history. And so Sandy Dak Hirsch teaches that uh, in the intro, uh, introductory level course. And just as we've heard from many other people, it is um, the elements of how to conduct a family medical history, including a genetic history, but it's not, not limited to that, certainly. Pedigree and construction, simple pedigree interpretation, and again, when to make a referral. Uh, Jean mm. mentioned the Family History Consensus Conference, and one of the uh, things you'll find if you go out and look at that document is that our evidence base for the clinical utility of genetic family history is very thin. It's something we've all, it's been an element of health care and medical care and nursing care for as long as anybody can, can trace back. And so it existed long before anyone thought of the terms evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine. But when looking at our evidence, uh, we, we don't have an organized body of knowledge on how to do it well, what works with particular cultures, what are, what are the ways to um, assist family members who are not from the dominant culture to access and communicate information, what does the term family mean? in various settings. Um, so those are all areas that we, we don't have a lot of evidence to guide us. Um, we, what we do have is our our, all of our traditions. So we talk with students about this and, again, try to emphasize with them when we get to a pedigree and interpretation and making a referral, for example, that there are people, um, many people will have, if I asked all of you to raise your hands, if there was a family history of heart disease or cancer or, or memory loss in your family or hypertension or diabetes, pretty soon everybody's hands would be up because these are common complex condition. Yet with, within each of those categories, there are going to be subsets of families that have particular risks based on um, a, a higher uh, component of genetic risk in that particular family. and We want our undergraduates just to get some sense of that. So when they hear a, a story from an individual, and it's many family members with early onset cancers, for example, that's a red flag that they should, they should be paying attention to and be thinking about what to say to that family, about what information have they had, what they like to have, do they know about the resources that the nurse can help them find. This course is paired with a course on communication skills. And I volunteered to give um, a presentation in this a long time ago that would build on the assessment course, but then talk about how the nurse would use these, these new communication skills, what, we, what I learned once is active listening, but it's therapeutic communication. When you're talking about sensitive information with families. So I continue what was introduced in the health assessment course, and now I tell them some stories. I have three families. I have some photographs that people have given me permission to use. I tell them about the family stories, and I said, then we go through what are the elements of therapeutic communication. And we use those family stories to illustrate what is it when there's denial? What happens when there's anger? I ask the students, how many times have your patients become angry with you? What happens when that, what, what's your response? What do you do when that happens? What about denial? When you want people to understand something, they're just not, they're not going for it. They're, no, and I give them the example. One of my stories is about Fragile X syndrome, and I, I tell them what Fragile X is and show them the family picture. And I tell them that in this family, the reason that those young men had learning problems was because their grandmother wrapped them too warmly, and they got overheated. And that is the true story in that family, and no matter what you say as a nurse, it's not going to change. That's the family story. And then I go on to tell them how with, um, actually, the mother uh, became acquainted with me. She said to me one day, I've been reading about Fragile X, and I kind of think our family fits. I don't, I'm not buying this thing about grandma wrapping the babies too tight. And I said, well, yeah, you know, I think you, you, you make a really good point here. And there are some people here that could help you find the answers to your questions. I, I don't know what the answers will be. So she was one among the first who did involve herself in some of the research on uh, detection of the gene for Fragile X syndrome, and that's truly what was going on in the family. So uh, we talk about what kinds of responses can you as a nurse give when you encounter something that doesn't quite make sense to you, but yet there's some resistance. 
So as we um, go through this um, this one hour long uh, presentation that I make, I talk about stigma, I talk about privacy, I create a, I've created a story about families where there's colon cancer and the word colon is not mentioned in that family. And then I talk about the area that I'm most familiar with, Huntington disease, even though it's a rare disease, it, re it brings up a lot of issues about um, psychiatric illnesses, stigmatizing behaviors that are not acceptable within and outside of a family, things about family secrets, and family myths. And then at the end of the class, I leave about 10 minutes. And by then, the students have written down all their therapeutic communication skills and all of the, the elements of what people might do and what they're supposed to do in response. And I say, now, this third of the room, you, you turn to the person next to you. You're going to be a pair. One is the nurse. One is the patient. The, this is where you're going to think about the colon cancer. This over here is the fragile X, and we're going to talk about some reproductive issues over here. This is the group that would pay attention to the risk for Huntington disease. And I ask the uh, patient in the pair to come up with a communication behavior. They're going, to, they're going to challenge their nurse in some way. They're going to be angry. They're going to be in denial. They're going to be very sad. Um, they're just going to be totally uninformed and, and clueless about. And then the other part of the pair is the nurse. So the nurse is going to have to respond to whatever their partner's behavior is. And give them a few minutes to do it. And then they write down for me what they did, what nursing, uh, what was the behavior of this uh, quote, patient, what therapeutic skills would be appropriate, what the nurse tried, the patient gives a little feedback, how well did her part, his or her partner do, and then they turn those in. It's very instructive for me to read them because it gives me a sense of what did they get out of the lecture and the presentation. It also has a side benefit that I don't care about, but the uh, faculty does know who was in class that day because um, we have those, those little, little bits of information and feedback from the student. I mentioned the honors independent study, and I've already described this a little bit for you, that we do try to set this up. Uh, it's a very popular uh, option, and uh, we could probably take more if we had more faculty who could uh, take these students or the clinical faculty. I had students who wanted to have experience with psych mental health and, and genetics issues. I've had students, had a student who was very interested in um, Turner syndrome and some of the uh, behavioral issues that families face, and that actually ended up as uh, she was one of our presidential scholars and, and she wrote a publishable paper on that. We have a young scientist program at our university. It's funded by an alum and it is a, an effort to identify those students who are especially promising as far as developing a research career and moving on into uh, nursing research. And students compete for this and then they are assigned to faculty. So of course some of us receive these, um, these matches with students. And I uh, had a young scientist student as an undergraduate student joined my research team, conducted li a literature review, did um, uh, helping us with a survey construction. This was on Huntington disease, and then she got to be uh, she got to present this at ISONG. We sent her to ISONG with a poster. It really introduced her to the the um, the world of uh, scientific inquiry, and she has gone on uh, to have a career as a research coordinator. This is something that did not work so well, so I'm glad I put this in. We have Genetics Journal Club, and we have this uh, primarily for our doctoral and postdoc students. We thought faculty would just be really enthused about coming, and you know what? <laughs> they weren't. They don't come. <laughs> um, and I think it's, well, there are a lot of reasons. Faculty are very busy. And um, what we do in Journal Club is we really try to push people's analytic thinking and critical thinking about what's published in the literature. And, uh, they, they, some faculty find that more or less interesting uh, on a given day. So we do uh, also have our masters and some of our undergraduate students who, who have an opportunity to come as well. I'll just very quickly mention what else is going on because I think that's one of the keys to success for us is that it's genetics is part of the whole package that you get at Iowa. It, it doesn't, the, it's almost like a bookend is pre-nursing all the way through the postdoc and then into the faculty. So we have a primary care course for our uh, nurse practitioners. I developed um, that component where students 
use uh, case studies that were published in, um, I think it was uh, contemporary pediatrics, some little, little snippets of uh, clinical cases that nurse practitioners would, uh, or physicians would uh, go through, you know, what is this, what's the diagnosis. I have a, a lecture series or set that goes online for the course, and then when we meet in class, I ask them to discuss their cases and to prioritize what their clinical decisions would be. What are you going to attend to first? What, when you do that, what Im impact does that have on the rest of the family? For example, there's a teenager that looks like he has Marfan syndrome. So what are you going to do first? Are you going to think about cardiology? Are you going to think about participation in sports? Are you going to think about the rest of the family and their risk for Marfan's? And so it's a really rich discussion with the nurse practitioner students. And the other thing we do is that we make sure every nurse practitioner student in this course spends a few hours in our genetics program or with an advanced practice nurse working in an area where they apply genetic knowledge, maybe the hemophilia clinic, for example. We have two online courses that are available at the, at the master's level or the graduate level, and these are taught by Sandra Dak Hirsch. These are also resources for you if you are interested in a graduate level course, and we now can offer them for variable credit. So each topic in here is worth one credit hour, and it is offered through our um, distance learning uh, program on campus. People who take this are master's students. Some of our postdocs are interested if they are missing certain components in their own uh, background. We've had faculty from around the country take this. We've also had clinicians. We had a nurse who went from the ICU to a metabolic clinic. Well, that's a big leap in your clinical practice, and she wanted to, uh, to be, prepare herself for that change. Uh, like many places, we have a DMP program, and the genetics is in our DMP uh, emerging science course. Ken Culp teaches that and some of the content that he selected. Uh, we also, Sandy gives a presentation on aging at our PhD course. Uh, gerontology is a major emphasis at our university, and these are the kinds of topics that Sandy includes. And also at our PhD level, I'll mention we have this uh, seminar, and I've collaborated with Julie. So we have students uh, from Clemson that come in through distance learning. We've had other doctoral students from other universities, often people who are planning a dissertation on a genetics topic, and they want to be in a seminar course examining the literature. So what what happened, what has and is continuing to happen with us is that we started out and we continue to collaborate with course faculty. So this was that door-to-door or one-to-one um, -one, um, communication with our colleagues. What, what can we do to contribute to your course? What fits with your course needs? We provide resources, whether it's ourselves or our materials. Sometimes, as I mentioned, those uh, ethics case studies um, give them to Howard and he uses them as he wishes. We have students who are interested. That's one of the biggest benefits is that, as was mentioned previously, this is not new to students. They're not, they're not um, daunted by the topic and it whets the appetite, especially these early courses for students who are really inclined to enjoy learning more about science and how you apply it to uh, human health issues. We have the advanced practice and genetics opportunities, so that does move sometimes people on into a career path that they hadn't considered. Several of our tenure track faculty have completed the SGI, so what started out as two faculty, now we have a number of people who get it, and they get it and apply it in different ways, so that has been very helpful. Sandy and Martha are now conducting a faculty survey on the needs in genomic nursing education and a little bit on assessing genomic literacy of faculty and students, and one of our um, research science students is helping with that. We partner with um, the um, faculty that I already mentioned. It's across our entire curriculum. It's part of the research conducted by many faculty. We have this wonderful network of clinical partners, and we've been through three deans since 1995, and they have all found this to be an important part of our program, and they endorse it. So that top-down part, sometimes when I first started meeting the people uh, on, along the wall, uh, we, we worried a lot about deans and how to get dean buy-in. And then we realized deans sometimes were far away from what happens in the day-to-day -day realm of, of education, yet that dean endorsement is a very powerful endorsement because it brings attention to the uh, program. It, um, it helps elevate the importance in the eyes of the faculty and the students. And I wholeheartedly endorse Alan's comments, partnership is key to long-term survival. <laughs> so you've got partnership right here. I'm glad somebody mentioned ISONG because that, that is a wonderful place to get renewed and get your batteries recharged when you get uh, 
kind of worried about how this is all going to fit together. So I'll be here until 4 o'clock when I have to catch um, a, a ride to the airport, and I'd be delighted to try to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so everybody knows they're going to go and join ISLON, right? Really and truly. Uh, most of the people here I know through ISLON, every one of us. I can't think of how we would have really done what we've done through ISLON. So if you haven't thought about it, you really need to think about it because this is an ongoing journey for you. It's not a one-time event where you're going to go and do a project and be through in six months or, or a year. Have any of you guys ever um, seen the Five Minute University on YouTube? Anybody seen that? Well, all of our deans were talking about it at UT, and I had to go look at it. It's really funny. This guy stands up and he goes, I can give you a degree in um, five minutes for $20. Because what I'm going to tell you is what you're going to remember if you are a political science major. And he has two sentences. And he goes through all the um, disciplines like this, and then he said, oh, and one minute more if you also want a degree in law. So <laughs> what, what I guess what that says to me is, uh, Judy, I think you mentioned, we've got to teach students how to learn. And what you're going to find in genetics, and it's, if anything scares me, it's that I'm not keeping up. You know, because we're very busy, and so we're busy managing and teaching and doing research and doing everything else. And my only fear is, oh my gosh, I wonder what was published in the last two months that I haven't read. So when you think about genetics, you have to think about this is kind of a long-term commitment, not to just doing a course, but to be creating a course that can be used effectively. Someone said here that they taught anatomy and physiology for so many years. Who was that? Right. Kathy, how long did you teach that? Right. It doesn't change. It's one of those things you can teach for years and kind of go home and do the same thing. Genetics is not that course. If that's the type of teaching you like to do, genetics is not the thing for you. So I'm going to talk a little bit, and I think um, Janet could have also talked about this, shared courseware, how we're sharing. So I guess what you should get from what Janet is talking about and what I'm talking about is there are other resources too at other universities that have already done this and they may be available to you and they may not and they may be available for some students but not for all students. So think about that as you're beginning wherever you are to look at all the resources of other institutions and resources that are on the web because um, it was already suggested today that data and research done by NIH supported efforts belong to all of us. So you can snatch those NCI slides because they're beautiful. So let me go on to look at, sorry, this. Okay. Everybody does this differently. I graduated in 2000 with my doctorate and then I did a postdoc in genetics. And the faculty weren't really into genetics. In fact, the main um, thing I heard was diabetes happen, happens across populations, but we don't have a course on diabetes. I thought, that's true, you know, that, that's true. And, and I wasn't convinced that I had to tell everybody that genetics was the way things were going to go. And I think one of the issues that you might hear is people say, I know you think everything is genes. Well, it's not that we think everything is genes. It's, we think if you understand your genetic predisposition, you may understand the, what the, how the environment affects your health. And that, when I tell people that, they seem to be more open. I'm not just, I haven't given away nursing 
and thought only as a, as a scientist. And I think you need to think that when you go back and talk to your, your faculty. So what I did was people would have me lecture in their classes. And I'm sure you've all done that. And I still lecture in some of those classes. And then the faculty have come along, and our faculty um, are pretty sophisticated. A lot of them are on oncology with MD Anderson, and they have a pretty good background in genetics. So check out your faculty and see what they know, because they may know more than you think they do, because all the nursing societies are teaching um, genetics as it applies to their discipline. So my um, mantra in life is, and I don't know why it is. Kill two birds with one stone. I don't like to kill birds, but I mean, make things really effective. So um, when we, we, I was asked to develop a program for the DMP students, okay, the Doctorate of Nursing Practice. I thought, oh, that will be really great. We'll, we will do this. But when we talk about shared courseware, you can even share it in your institution. You know, before people would come and they would say, well, I'm a master's student. Can I take that? At first, they couldn't. But now we think, well, why not? Why couldn't they take it as an elective? If they're a master's student, and why couldn't we um, kind of make a basic class that we could apply across our cur curriculum? To some extent, we've done that. So we developed an online um, genetic course. And for the DMP program, it was emerging technologies. So I also have two hours of the genetic course that can stand alone. That's killing two birds with one stone. And then when I um, add it to, um, to the DMP course, I have lectures where people come in and talk about stem cells. They talk about proteomics. They talk about other things that are not necessarily related to genetics. And, um, but you have to remember there's a big difference in student populations. And I know you're from all over the country. And um, we have students that are even DMP students, you think they're very sophisticated, and they're not. They come and they say, you know, I took an elective, but I couldn't handle the technology, so I dropped it. And I'm not talking about sophisticated technology. I'm talking about um, classes that are um, broadcast from our university that go to another one. So I think really, when you start talking about these um, res these teaching methods like Blackboard, sounds very simple to us. It is not to new students. It's not to those doctoral prepared students or even master's prepared students and um, second degree students. So we have to think about that. Um, change this again. Did I go too far? I did. Okay. So we. Well, I really. Okay. Okay. So we um, started our formal genetics course, and I really like doing that. I like focusing initially on one population, I mean, a one student population. You may not do that. You may go back and just decide to integrate it across the curriculum. We've heard both ways. Um, but you don't have to do it all if it's already been done. Find out what's been done. So we started with 16 students. And they're all from all around Texas and the neighboring states. So one of the things you have to remember when you're designing a class like this is people have genetic um, problems in their families, right? They're still people, even though they're nursing students. And a lot of times, you're going to have students and maybe faculty come to you that, um, because they've been touched personally by what you're saying. And you can't always do that when you're working on a web-based course. So that's kind of a drawback. So, sorry, I think this keeps jumping around. You know what? I think this is not the presentation I brought, but that's okay. We're going to go with it. I wrote it up there. Did you? Did you? That's okay. That, that's okay. I, I can just wing it and. Um, because I can change it right can now. Can you? I had it loaded well, it's, up. Well, it's somewhat similar. But I'm thinking, I'm going crazy. I'm thinking, okay, I got a problem here. <laughs> You were, what's, what was the name of it? It was just, uh, let me look. That one, Genetics for Nursing Practice. Yeah, this is the one that you had loaded. Was it? it I don't think the so. The other one. Okay, okay, all right. Well, here we go. It's not that big of a deal. See, things happen. 
Okay. 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 Yeah. Yes, the same one. Okay. Well, I guess I didn't bring the, the this one, but we're gonna we're gonna go with this. Okay. So this course was also developed for the SREB. Does any is anybody familiar with the SREB here? Are any of y'all from Texas? from Alabama, from southern states. I have a list of southern states here and I didn't know what they were. Uh, Georgia, Delaware, Florida, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland. Delaware? Did I? S <laughs> Delaware? <laughs> Judy, you scared me. I thought, it is on here. Yeah, Delaware, Georgia, Kentucky, <laughs> Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia is in, are in the South. I don't know because I'm not a native, but I was surprised. But anyway, if you're in those states, we now have on the SREB website or electronic campus a way for you, for your graduate students, faculty and DMP and PhD students to get on our campus and take this class as part of your campus. You'll get credit for it at your campus. So this was something that we started years ago. Sharon and I were on this um, program together. And it's kind of neat because you can, you, you don't have to develop it for them. They, but they actually come to the UT campus, sign on as UT, um, register with our campus, and we actually teach the course. So because we were going to develop this for other states and for our school, we wanted to do a very good job. You know, it's very nerve-wracking to teach it at your own school, but when other people start coming to you, you really want to do a, a stellar um, job of this. So what I did was, how many of you at your institution have instructional design specialists? Get them on board because I think you're really going to need them. If you haven't done anything like this before and you haven't um, used courseware, I'm sure most of you have, but you haven't done a completely different um, course. And if you're going to do a standalone course, I did. And what I did was I thought, you know, I'm a nurse, but I got somebody with a non-nursing background who's a geneticist with me, and I got this specialist, and then I got a basic scientist together. And as a team, we developed the course. So it was really nice, but that instructional um, design specialist brought the whole project into perspective. You know, we each had our niche. I was the nurse, we had the scientists, um, bench scientists, and we each had something that we wanted to put in this course. But she made sure that it was balanced and that the scope was good and that it ran well together. And we met six months frequently, every week, together as a team before we put the course together. Um, because it was a distance course and we wanted it to, to, to be really good. And we had a steering committee with the SREB and we identified topics and objectives for those topics. And like everybody else, for our topics we used the um, essentials of nursing practice, genetics and genomics. So we went down each one of those and um, really took from them what we wanted to put in the class. We wanted them to understand basic genetics and genomics concepts. We wanted to analyze family history and pedigree, which we have done. We've talked about a lot here. Advocate for the rights of clients. Apply understanding of relationship and genomics to health prevention, screening, diagnostics. You'll get all this. Look at the competencies. All this is already developed for you. And then we also wanted them to be able to interpret genetic research and apply the principles of evidence-based practice to clinical practice. Because it's been said here, and I think the important part of all of this it's not that they know about mitosis, who really cares? But that they can apply it to clinical practice, whatever that is. Your story was great. It was just taking the pedigree. That was the application to clinical practice. It can go from there to being very sophisticated uh, in those decisions. But um, for the MP students, we really, really focused on their clinical practice. So I have here examples um, of things that were cleared geared for the clinician. Each student had to develop a case study using a patient they were likely to encounter in their clinical population. Now, if you're not with those students, you have to put likely to encounter. Judy, I appreciate the fact that you didn't even want to look at their pedigree because it's personal to them. Um, and I agree with that to some extent, too. You know, you have to kind of wing it on these 
uh, how you do your projects. On this one, some students actually have case studies and some don't. The ones that have a case study, we wanted the, them to write them up. So, and we had, I see um, the hand up in the air. Um, we wanted them to do a, a case study that was really good. So this was just the rundown on the SREB. It's nonprofit, okay? And we're on their electronic campus. And you can learn and understand educational opportunities. Go on their electronic campus if you're in the South. How do you find that? Just SREB. Um, you can Google it. I Google it all the time. Okay, so the course development is a web based course. It's to suit the needs of the nurse clinician. Let's talk about barriers encountered. Um, we had to work through the costs. If you have students from other universities, you can't charge them for lab. You can't charge them for the library. So I actually had to sit down myself and negotiate this with the registrar and with everybody at our university. And that sounds like an easy thing to do. It was not an easy thing to do. And every time I would think it was accomplished, the next semester it was like we're back at stage one and I would have to say, okay, now who do I have to talk to now? And then I would talk to the SREB. I would talk to numerous people. It was really enough to drive you crazy. So if you're going to do that, think about it up front. And the registrar, you would think it might be their job, but it is not. It is your job, I think. It is in my university. So the other thing, um, and that's a continual journey. Every semester, you have to revisit that. Um, reference books, we did not use a reference book. It was very hard for our students. We really need to do that. They did not like it. And different ways that faculty approach it. If you're teaching in the course with other faculty, you have to know that everybody does things differently and the students have to get used to that. Successes, we developed a team that works well together. The students love the course and uh, they help um, shape that course from year to year. You can actually, I know there are other um, methods, other courseware besides Blackboard. How many people use Blackboard? But there are other methods, and I know, I don't remember the names of them. Okay, D2L. There are ways to transfer courses to different courseware, and you have got to arrange them according to specific standards when you do that. So if you plan to do that, make sure that you have a specialist work with you initially. That's a priority. Um, I enjoyed starting with a new program. I'm a focused person. I'm a researcher. It was great for me. They didn't come to me and say, just integrate it everywhere in the program. That does not appeal to me. So I think what you have to do is, and also I was given the task that we would have the students that's required course. I like that method. Um, have enough experience, faculty and maintenance issues. You can't design a course like anatomy in um, Blackboard or anything else and expect it to be good for 10 years or a year. Things change. So you've got to go back with that faculty and visit it each semester and update it. That has to be done. Um, work with the curriculum develops ex development experts. I love them. I have a great respect for them. Use interactive learning, blogs, reflection, discussion board, directed discussion. I wasn't really into doing the blogs. The students love them. Use a textbook. Offer a lecture if possible on basic genetics. You know, our students, to be honest, did not like web base initially for the basics. They wanted to talk to a real life person. And we're glad because we like to be real life people. The other thing I wanted to talk about that's kind of exciting is how many people are, I know we talked a little bit about the neighborhood. How many people are um, familiar with Second Life? How many of you have an avatar? My avatar's name is Ginger. It's Italian. I can't remember the last name. <laughs> I think if you're Kathy, when I think Filatario or something. Um, and that's who I am as teacher. And so we across the UT, UT system, so that means there's two UT people here, and I'm not trying to glorify Texas. I know everybody's tired of that. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do is have a systems-wide initiative that I'm leading in nursing where we will have an island. 
if you don't know this language, I didn't know it two weeks ago, so it's okay. And that island is where you develop a community of avatars, which are people. And the students will come as avatars and attend our classes, and we're going to probably put genetics in second life. Um, so there's lots. When you talk about it, it's so exciting how education is changing, how we can go forward, how we can make this exciting. The only thing that scares me is the faculty are not really with it. I'm not with it. But you know, I celebrate each and every one of you guys because you have volunteered to do something different, to go beyond what you know, to apply it, to be scared. There is a fear factor. But keep going. Anything that comes up, use it. Have fun with those students. Listen to them. Don't be afraid. Become an avatar, as I am now, Ginger. And have fun with this. Thanks. Well, Kathy's finding the slides. I'm going to go ahead and just tell you that I came about to this from the other side, in that I had no basic education or interest in genetics other than I'm the sole survivor of three siblings born to parents, both of whom carried the gene for cystic fibrosis. And my brother died before I was born. I was the replacement child. My sister died when I was 10 and she was six. So. I was interested in genetics from a personal perspective. And I had a doctoral student who was working with me named Shirley Jones, who's one of the leaders in the genetics movement. And Shirley came to me as wanting me to chair her dissertation, which was on the diff diffusion of innovation. And the innovation she was looking at was genetics in practice. And at that year, Shirley was president of ISONG. And yeah, that's what I called it. Okay. And so. Um, she said to me, you've always had an interest in genetics. I think you should join ISONG. Well, I was trying to be supportive of my doctoral students. So I said, yeah, sure, I, I can do that for you, Shirley. It's only $100. What's the big deal? And um, the next thing I know, I got a phone call one day. Shirley had nominated me to be um, the nurse on the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Genetic Testing. And deja vu all over again. This was the room we met in for three years. Um, and I said, well, I really don't know very much about genetics. And Shirley said, well, that's really good. But you do know about public policy, and you do know about nursing. And we need nursing's voice at the table. Well, it's very scary to represent 2.7 million people. And I knew I could never represent nursing, because we don't agree on a whole lot of things. But what I could do is bring a nursing perspective to the table. So here I sat with. You know, the last genetics I had had was a course in 1968. Shirley was my friend. And I was a women's health nurse practitioner. But I sat here. My PhD is in public policy. So I thought, oh, it's going to be really cool to make policy. And um, we sat here for three years till um, the um, Secretary Shalala, who, to who had appointed us in the Clinton administration, she was gone. The new administration came in. They had a different view on genetics. And they appointed a different committee. But um, I sat here for three years, knew very little about this. And then I thought, you know, I was able to represent genetics, bring a genetics perspective to the table, and talk about, you know, Clinician as opposed to medicine, um, health care as opposed to medicine, primary care provider as opposed to physician, and make sure that a nursing perspective was part of all the discussion. So I did that for a while. And then I thought, I really owe the nursing community something. This has been a peak life experience for me. So I, Dale Lee was sitting with me, and Dale sitting back there. She's the guilty party. And I said to her one day, you know, I'll be really happy to help the genetics community, because this has been a great experience. And if I saw needs any help, I'm happy to help. I could be a board member or something. And the next thing I know, I got a phone call from the executive secretary saying, we're so pleased you're running for the presidency of ISON. I went, I am? Dale, what did you do to me? And I decided at that point I had probably better learn something about genetics, other than 
the course I took in 1968 and my ongoing interest in what I had learned being on the Secretary's Advisory Committee. So at that point, I signed up for Cindy's Web-Based Genetic Institute, took that for 18 weeks, then signed up for the Summer Genetics Institute here at NIH, did that for eight weeks, and then I figured I knew a little bit about genetics, and then I was ready to be president of ISONG, and Kathy followed me, and she came that summer while I was here. She interviewed me before she agreed to run for president-elect because she wanted to know what my strategic plan was. So I, I sat there with a really good, somebody who had really good, basic, solid clinical knowledge. I had taken these two courses, and I was ready to roll. So that's how I got into genetics, which was very different than most of the other people sitting on the side who had a lot of formal training. I was always interested. I had a passion for it. You know, it was something that had my mother lived, she would have been really pleased that I had done this. And then I went back home, and um, I wanted to start putting this in the curriculum. In Virginia, um, I found out being from Boston and moving to Virginia was a real eye-opening experience because you know, we do things, you know, if Mr. Jefferson didn't want it done, it didn't need to be done. Things move very slowly. The White House of the Confederacy is in the middle of our campus. They keep reenacting the war of northern aggression because they keep hoping it'll come out differently. <laughs> and it's just a very different place to be. So I, uh, what happened to me was um, I was teaching undergraduate nursing of women, had genetics in that course. That was fun. And our RN program is set up so that the RN to BS students had to take an elective. And they were desperately looking for enough electives because we had over-enrolled students, didn't have enough electives to go around. So a friend of mine said to me, how would you like to teach an elective in genetics? And I thought, yeah, I know this stuff now. I can do that. So for three times, I went, I taught this course. And um, you can, in our school, you can teach a course as a special topics for three times without getting formal curriculum approval. So my colleague who was my big, my big champion, who was the coordinator of the RN program, we offered this course three times. It never did get to go through the formal curriculum approval process. Well, when, I, when she said to me, how would you like to teach this course, I had retired at the point, so a little extra income isn't going to be bad. I'm going to be teaching it online, but I needed you know, I didn't have a semester to develop the course because when you're an adjunct faculty member, they don't give you release time, nor do they pay you for course preparation. So I remembered all the material that Cindy, who will be talking to you about it later, had developed as part of the Web-Based Genetic Institute, and I noticed that you could license this material. I think at that point it was $300, $250, $300. It was a reasonable, I'm sure it's more now, but at that point it was no, maybe $500 was somewhere in that range. It wasn't astronomical. So I went to the school and I said, hmm, I'd love to teach this course. There's this wonderful material out there that can be a course master. And they said, well, if, you know, we're not really interested in that. And I thought, well, I'm going to make my life easy. I bought it. <laughs> Negotiated for a personal license from Cindy, which meant I could use it in one program. So it was mine. I talked to my friend and I said, if I ever stop teaching this, you're going to buy the license from me, right? Well, she's gone, but yeah, that was, that was the deal we had set up. So I put the course together. It was for RNBS students taking the course as an elective, totally online. And you can see what the enrollment was that I had. Uh, you know, a total of about 70 students over a, a calendar year. And these were students who ranged from brand new associate degree graduates or diploma school graduates. We still have diploma schools in Virginia. They're alive, well, and thriving. And um, we move slowly, I told you. So um, the students ranged from people who had graduated the month before they started the RN program to people who had been out there forever practicing, and for some reason they were going back for their bachelor's degree. They were all working as registered nurses. And let me tell you, what I learned from what they knew about some of the practice issues, that's scary. But they were all out there working as registered nurses. And so what I did is Cindy's material at that point had 16 modules in it. Well, the first time I taught the course was in the summer, and the summer is six weeks. So I looked at what can I do when I took like eight of the 16 or 10 of the 16 modules and I put together the stuff 
that didn't include the basic clinical genetics but included the application. And Cindy's got it laid out in a way that, you know, it says here's what you can do if it's a total standalone course, here's what you can do for clinical practice. So I started with just these particular units. This is right out of the syllabus and those are the dates that I used just to give you a sense of how long the students had. Then when I taught it for a full year, uh, for a full semester that was 16 weeks long, I decided to use all 16 modules. And the stuff is out there. It's a beautifully designed thing. If you want to make your life easy, you get Cindy's license. And I'm not, I'm not selling her material. This is, you know, I'm sorry, but it, you know, I was out there, you know, I'm, I'm an adjunct. I'm retired. I want to make life simple. Somebody's already developed this stuff. Why would I reinvent the wheel? Every week there are, there is, you know, readings, there are case studies, there are quizzes, there's all sorts of stuff. It's just there. Cut, paste, put it into Blackboard. I once said to Cindy, if you had it in Blackboard and I could just copy it, life would be much easier. I wouldn't have to cut and paste. But, you know, I know how to cut and paste really well. So I put the course together and then in the spring of 2008 it looked basically the same. What happened? There are assignments, there were quizzes. The quizzes are in the course. You just take the quiz, you put it into Blackboard quiz, it's there. Blackboard grades it, very easy. Discussion forums, like for example, one of the discussion forums was read the newspaper. Find something in the newspaper that relates to genetics or genomics. Discuss it in 250 words or less. Respo you, know, you have to respond to at least one of your classmates. Um, pedigree interpretation, there were pedigrees in the course, cut and paste them in, ask the students to do the pedigrees. What I decided for these RNs, who were scared to death of this stuff, especially the ones who have been in practice for 20 years, they were scared spitless. And, or maybe not spitless, but anyway, they were out there. I decided that they would get credit if they completed the assignment. There would be no taking off points if you got it wrong, other than on the quizzes. If you complete the assignment, you get full credit. And what I would do is I would leave the assignment up the last day of the assignment. I would post the answer and say to them, take a look at what you did, compare it to the answer so that you have the individual learning, but I'm not going to grade you as wrong. Now, it was very interesting because in some of the ethical issues, these nurses who had been practicing for 20 years, they knew the answer. The world is black and white. The family must do da 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 They'd read my answer, which would say, these are the issues you may want to consider in talking to the family. But I decided I wasn't, I never called anybody out on their, you know, rigid answers. It was like, here's, it was learning for them at the self level. They got to draw a pedigree. They got, got Mrs. Smith and Mr. Jones. And at first I had them set up to make, t like we did in the web-based genetic institute, we were given a partner. We had to make a phone call, do it over the phone. Well, these RNs, that was too stressful for them. They worked different hours. They didn't, if they didn't know their partner, they were scared to death to make the phone call. So anyway, I just gave them a pedigree, gave them a history and said, you know, give the answer, draw the pedigree, submit it by email. They um, had to identify resources. There were case studies and case scenarios. And at the beginning, I assigned them their cases randomly so that they couldn't just choose the cases that they were part of their practice. If you were a peds person, you know, because Cindy works at a children's hospital, the nice thing about this course is the peds people don't feel like orphans. You know, a lot of times in health assessment, the peds people feel like real orphans because there's not pediatric specific content. There's cases across the life cycle. So I would just, rand I would assign them, you know, five of you do this case, five of you do this case, five of you do this case. And at the end, after they, you know, went through four or five cases, I said, okay, pick the scenario you want. So towards the end, they had some choices over which scenarios they picked. So, the, you know, they had re required textbooks, which were the consensus document, the ISONG standards, and um, Jean and Dale have a wonderful book um, that's case studies. The students love the book. And then I gave them some optional readings and I said to them, you know, I had sent them an email that said, here are some optional books, take a look at them, figure out which ones best fit your learning style. So they had some books that they could choose among if they wanted them, if they didn't want them, but they, a lot of them felt like they needed some of that basic genetic information because they didn't have access to it. So they had um, 
some choices in terms of textbooks. These are adult learners. Now these are some of the student comments that I got unsolicited. These were not on the course evaluations. These were emails that I got from the students towards the end of the course. I really enjoyed learning about genetics. Now I have a better understanding. And um, so it was really interesting in terms of what some of the students, you know, self-admitted to learning. Um, and, you know, I did find people who were really, you know, their light got turned on. And this particular student is looking at an advanced practice um, role in genetics, and she's not sure whether she's going to go and do a master's degree in nursing or she's going to go do the genetic counseling. And I tried to work with our genetic counseling folks to see if maybe we could combine the nursing core and the um, genetic counseling to make some kind of a hybrid program. But uh, the director of that program didn't think it was appropriate for nurses to have that kind of content. So we, I decided I wasn't going to fight that battle anymore. Um, and um, you know, these are the kind of comments I got from students looking at um, you know, their interest. And it, to me, this was very rewarding. There are additional comments on the um, course outlines, but um, I just went with what I had in my email inbox as I prepared these slides because um, I ended up um, not having as much time as some of the others because I ended up being a last minute substitute for one of the speakers. So I just put this together with what was in my inbox. Didn't get downstairs to the file cabinet where all of my pre-retirement documents are stored. Um, but they really did learn a lot and they enjoyed the course. And um, it was a good learning experience for most of them. Some of them struggled more than others. So, you know, here's somebody who was running a little bit late. <laughs> which, you know, on an online course I think it's wonderful because you can learn at your own pace. I'm teaching online, right now I'm teaching a course in our RN to BS program called Information Literacy in Healthcare. We started in August, one of the students already has completed all of the assignments except for the collaborative project. There are others who are still on week one. So what happened to the course? Well, the curriculum changed and electives were no longer necessary. So the RN students no longer have an elective. And then um, given, like all of us are facing budgetary issues, um, anything that's not required isn't offered anymore. You know, we've cut to the bone. Um, the RN to BS coordinator changed. So my champion is now living in California doing stained glass. <laughs> which I'm going to see her next month. I hope she's got some pretty stained glass. But, you know, like if there's somebody who really believes this is important, Okay, the material is now quote unquote integrated in the curriculum, whatever that means. I don't believe it because we are um, an NLNAC school and our site visit is next month and we just got the final copy of the self-study in a PDF. So I opened it up and I searched the self-study, found five instances of the word genetic. Two of them I know are not accurate. The other three are examples of what's happening and I still am going in and doing a guest lecture in the Nursing of Women course in genetics. And that isn't even listed in the self-study. So I don't know um, where they're at, but I, I'm, it's, it just went away because it wasn't something that was suiting the purpose. So what's needed? I really think that what's needed, like when Kathy called and told me about this faculty champion meeting, I said, I'm not the right one for VCU. I don't work there full time anymore. You really need a faculty champion. That's very important. You need someone who's paying attention to this material. <clears throat> and there need to be curricular mandates. I think the essentials is going to make a whole world of difference. Having, you know, because if, you know, Quite frankly, we're like everybody else. If it's, you know, I have this cartoon, it's a bunch of dogs, and one of them's coming up to the desk of the teachers, the dog teacher sitting there, and the dog student is going, it's rolling over on the final. <laughs> if it's not on the test, if it's not in the accreditation stuff, you know, we're not going to do it. We're no different than the dog who isn't going to roll over if it's not on the final. 
So there need to be some, there need to be carrots, but there also need to be sticks. And I believe that's important. I also believe you need to have support from the academic leaders in the institution. When the essential, when the um, book, book came out that talked about the competencies, I made an appointment with the undergraduate curriculum committee and with the graduate curriculum committee to bring in the book and share the competencies with them. They were very polite. They took the book and they said, thank you. And I said, do you have any questions? Oh, no, if we do, we'll be in touch with you. Well, that's the last I've heard from them. Because we have an associate dean that doesn't see this as important as I see it. So you really need to have some cheerleaders in the institution. I think that's very critical. And um, so what I would say is get a friend and be, be obnoxious. Because that's what makes change happen. You know, nice people don't get change made. What, you know, what is it, you know, um, there's also a cartoon that says that, you know, you know, nice women never change the world. You know, be, you know, being nice isn't enough. So you really need to focus and work with people. And I had a great fun developing the course. I was very sad when it went away. All I can say is the students who had the experience found it to be very good. And my advice is, don't spend hundreds of hours recreating the wheel. There's lots of wonderful, good resources out there if you know how to copy and paste and you know how to ask people for permission and licensing. It's very easy to get good material and you don't have to spend hours and hours developing it on your own because it's already out there. Brilliant people have done it. And if any of you have been in things like the Summer Genetic Institute or the Web-Based Genetics Institute or any of these other short courses that are out there, there's tons of material. And it be makes it very easy to get what you need. So I thank you all very much. And I wish you luck. And I'm happy to talk to anyone who's looking for help and guidance along the way. Okay, thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the interdisciplinary model and what we've done at the University of Pittsburgh. I think it's important to discuss this model because I think some of you may need it, want it, may need it at the beginning when you're getting things off the ground and then not need it so much anymore. But um, I think it's important that we discuss this model because um, and, and to discuss some of the barriers that I ran into, as well as some of the little nuggets of advice that I have for you. So let me tell you a little bit of background about how I came to be at a school of nursing. So you know, when you, when you start talking about this top-down approach and having the um, buy-in from your upper administration, the dean at the school of nursing at the University of Pittsburgh was actively recruiting a faculty member to come into the school to integrate genetics and genomics into the curriculum as well as hopefully bring on board some of the genetic and genomic research into the school as more and more of their nurse scientists became interested in integrating genomics into their research. So she tried very, very hard to find a nurse faculty member who could bring all of that. We're talking about the end of 1999 here, and it, it was just really hard to find those individuals. And that is not the case anymore, okay? Um, things have progressed enormously over the last 10 years. But at that point in time, her only alternative was to look towards a non-nurse to bring into the School of Nursing. And this is not unusual for the University of Pittsburgh, we actually have a fair number of non-nurse faculty that teach in our program and that are, or have their primary appointments in the School of Nursing. So, but however, I did want to point it out that, you know, one of the things that happened at that point in time may not need to happen today, but it's still an option for your school. 
All right, so in the year 2000, I came on board at the School of Nursing, um, primary appointment in the School of Nursing with a secondary appointment in the Department of Human Genetics so that I could keep my grassroots simmering there in the, in the department. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the advantages and disadvantages of having um, a geneticist in your School of Nursing. So the, first, let me tell you the advantages to me have far outweighed any advantages and um, advantages to the school have been that it, for those of you who are here and fretting about incorporating genetics and genomics into your curriculum if a geneticist were to come along and 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 be able to do all of that for you you may breathe a little sigh of relief okay so that's one advantage that you can bring in someone who can actually incorporate this into the curriculum and um, alleviate that from some of the faculty while they're also trying to incorporate genetics and genomics into thread them into their curriculum all right so it alleviates some of the burden on the faculty okay I'll talk a little bit about the barriers that I encountered later on because the faculty were you know, a lot of them were happy to have this this uh, person come on board and help them, but then there were also some faculty who um, were part of the barrier that I encountered. Um, another advantage to the school is having brought in a geneticist that actually brought in the ability to incorporate genetic and genomic research into a lot of the neuroscientists' trajectory of research. So. Over time, we have now have, you are in the minority if you're a nurse scientist at the School of Nursing at the University of Pittsburgh and do not have a genetic or genomic component to your research. So we have been able to facilitate that and um, I'll talk a little bit later about our training grant and how training, that training grant as well as the research that's going on at the school benefits our undergraduate students so they're not mutually exclusive um, issues. I have seen great advantages to myself and one of the best advantages that I can tell you is from dealing with my nurse colleagues I have a better appreciation of the phenotypes that I want to investigate and I'll give you a really good example some of my NIH funded research is looking at the contribution of molecular variation that accounts for recovery after traumatic brain injury. So that's why I, I love hearing Dr. Guttmacher talk, because I would love to just pick him up and plop him in study section so that people will realize this is stuff that we need to be doing. Um, you know, we need to be looking at how our, the genetic variation that we bring to the table of our, you know, for folks who have sustained these injuries, how you recover after that injury could be very variable. And I did not have an appreciation for patient outcomes until I came to the School of Nursing. And so a big chunk of my research trajectory I owe to collaborations with my nurse colleagues. So, you know, I have, by and large, encountered a lot of, of advantages from being in the School of Nursing. Um, I would say a disadvantage has also been somewhat of an advantage. So I am an oddity. All right, so when I go to the ISONG meetings, I know that I am one of the few non-nurse members of ISONG. So it, it is, you know, I am a little bit of an oddity. And sometimes that's, you know, gives you one of those feelings like you do want, you want, you know, people who, who are like you and understand you. Um, and sometimes it's, it's difficult to be a little odd. But at the same time, that oddity has actually um, been an advantage to me. The president of the American Society of Human Genetics invited me to be a member of the Information and Education Committee for three years for the society, and that was based on my unique role as a nurse educator. And so there, ha so being odd has its advantages and its disadvantages. And I think the the oddity ha actually has been more of an advantage over the years. Um, so what have we done at Pitt? So I I know that. There's less advocacy for a standalone course um, than, than, you know, some of the other uh, models that you've probably heard about. But I advocated real strongly for a full semester genetics, genomics, um, molecular therapeutics course for our undergraduate students. And since the year 2000, all of our undergrad students have been required to take a full semester genetics course. 
Um, currently, all of our DMP students, it's required of them. And for our other doctoral students, as well as our specialty role students, um, the course is an elective. However, um, you know, let me give you a little bit of background about why I advocate for the standalone course. Now, I also advocate for the threading and the integration throughout the curriculum. I think that that is a very important piece because as your students move through the curriculum, it's very important that we show some solidarity here. And if, if it, you know, you have to have, and if you have faculty who are not incorporating genetics and genomics when it's appropriate, I mean, we don't want to shove it down their throats, but when it's appropriate, um, our faculty need to be incorporating it because we need to thread that and show the students that we have solidarity and that what they're learning in that full semester standalone course is actually being applied. So I advocated for the full semester standalone course because my philosophy in teaching is if you teach the students the scientific basis of genetics and genomics, you have now empowered them to understand what's currently going on in genetics and genomics and you have empowered them to understand what's going to happen 10 years from now. And that is incredibly important because as we all know, we are right now at the tip of the iceberg for understanding genetics, genomics, how our genome works, how genes interact with one another, how the environment interacts with our genes. We are only seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. And then as far as translation to healthcare is concerned, we're not even at the tip of the iceberg yet. So empower your students by making sure that they understand the basic science of genetics and genomics, and that will serve them well in the future. Now, this may sound scary, but that's why sometimes you need to bring in someone who can do that if you don't feel comfortable doing that yourselves, all right? And we'll talk a little bit about where you can find these experts. And I advocate for this because, um, you know, and, and, and I advocate for integration throughout the curriculum because I think we need to show our students resources that they can use to um, carry themselves forward. I think that, you know, a really good example is a lot of us will talk about oncotyping in our courses, all right? So Oncotype DX is a test that looks at the level of gene expression of a battery of genes in breast cancer cells. And we use a lot of that information for prognosticating. We use a lot of that information for figuring out what intervention what um, uh, chemotherapy might work best for some of these individuals, all right? And it's based on the gene regulation that's going on in their cancer cells. Now, if you talk about that without discussing with your students some of the background science in gene regulation and gene expression, then the next time the next test comes along that uses a lot of the same type of information, they're, they're going to have to relearn okay, because they're learning about a new test. If they learn the underlying science behind these tests, the next time a new test comes out, they're not going to have to re-educate themselves. They're going to say, ah, this is just another application for that science, all right? So if we t teach them about gene regulation, gene expression, and tell them how our endogenous environment, for example, hormones, as well as our exogenous um, environment, such as micronutrients, vitamins, meds that we give folks, how those actually interact with our genes to turn them on and off. Once you've explained the science of that to them, the next med that comes along that interacts with the gene and that's, how it, it, that's its mechanism of action, they're going to understand it, they're going to get it, even though that med might not be out for another five or ten years. So that was my biggest advocacy for a standalone course was if we can get the science across within that full semester course and integrate um, throughout the curriculum, then I think we would be setting our students up for the best success for the future. All right. So we do have separate courses for undergrad and graduate students. And I'll talk a little bit about that later when I talk about my advice um, to you guys because one of the things that we did not start out doing was separate them and, and learned very quickly um, that we needed to do that. We do cross-list our graduate course and I will talk to you a little bit about the advantages of that, what it brings to the table for, um, for that graduate course. We do have other full semester offerings. We have um, a minor in uh, genetics that we offer at the school as well as a post bac and a post-master's healthcare certificate in genetics that we offer to our students. And a lot of the full semester courses that we've been able to develop as 
electives and these additional courses, those were th those have actually come about because of the training grant that we got. Um, through the NINR. So again, you see a lot of things intertwining to, to um, pull in resources and then how it helps our students. So our undergrad students are welcome to take graduate level elective courses. We actually encourage it in their last semester of coursework because the way the University of Pittsburgh works is that automatically becomes a graduate course that you can apply towards your graduate education degree. Um, so we do advocate for students to take uh, graduate level classes as undergrads. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that everybody go out and hire someone, bring someone in to uh, teach genetics, especially in our current uh, economic environment where it's hard to bring in anybody. Um, but to really give some thought to, uh, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, would you feel more comfortable bringing someone in to either help co-teach a course with you, guest lecture in your courses, or maybe even bring someone in um, to teach a standalone course to your nursing students from somewhere else on campus. So in other words, you're not hiring someone. The university and your school of nursing is not hiring someone. You're actually using expertise from elsewhere on campus. And we use this a lot at the University of Pittsburgh. We actually, a lot of our undergraduate um, more basic science courses are not taught by um, School of Nursing faculty. We bring in folks from other schools of the health sciences to teach those courses for us. And that works out really well because everybody does what they do best and our students benefit from it. So, um, you know, it, it is something that I, I think everyone here needs to entertain. Um, you know, it, going out and looking on campus and seeing who you have available to you um, to bring in and help you teach these courses, at least in the beginning. And then as you feel more comfortable with the content, you can move towards um, relying more on, on your own in-house faculty. So some of the barriers that uh, we encountered. So again, we had that upper level buy-in, you know, um, from the administration, but I encountered a lot of faculty who really weren't sure why we were bringing genetics into the curriculum, who really weren't sure why they needed to even hire someone to think about bringing this into the curriculum. And so that, that barrier, one of the, the ways that we came up to deal with that barrier, because we thought that maybe some of the barrier was ignorance, all right? And so we moved ahead with faculty workshops, all right? We had, we had four half-day faculty workshops spread out over four weeks. And it was elective, so in some respects, we were preaching to the choir, to the folks who showed up um, to these workshops. However, in the end, I think what these faculty workshops did was they gave faculty a little bit more empowerment because they now had more of an understanding about genetics and genomics and how it was impacting clinical care, all right? Clinical care in their arena, their area of expertise, that they weren't necessarily fully appreciative of. So once faculty realized how much back in 2000 genetics and genomics was already getting into the healthcare system, then they started to realize that, um, you know, maybe this is something I need to be paying attention to. The other thing was bringing these faculty on board, giving them some empowerment um, with a better understanding of genetics and genomics, letting them know what kind of expertise was now in the School of Nursing that they could pull upon, and then also, um, you know, giving them ideas about where to go and get more information if they needed to be brought more up to date in their area of expertise. That was then passed along to the students. So we had nursing faculty who now felt empowered and, and impassioned and then brought that into their courses and that was passed along to the students. So really we took this top-down approach where we had buy-in from the administration and then brought in the, the rest of the faculty through education. All right. Um, another barrier that I, I encountered, and you, you, some of you may ha have this situation or have experienced it also, other schools on campus, so other schools, of, even schools of the health sciences, had no idea what we were doing over at the School of Nursing. And so, you know, this is, this is true, I think, of all campuses. A lot of times you don't realize what's going on down the street. You may know more about what's going on across the country 
than you do what about what's going on down the street. And this was exactly what was going on when I would talk to colleagues outside of the School of Nursing and told them where I was residing. They had, they had no idea the great things that the School of Nursing was up to, the research that was going on there, the curriculum that had been developed, the extent of education that we could offer nurses at the School of Nursing. They had no idea. And so I was out there advocating for the School of Nursing and, and, and your profession with all of these non-nurse people to bring them up to date because people really didn't have an appreciation of the awesome things that were going on at the School of Nursing. So that was a barrier for a little while. Most of these barriers are now gone. All right. I wish I could say every faculty member um, now is rah-rah genomics, but um, at least they're like, yay, genomics. Um, it's, it's getting there. It's better. And we, do, we have built a, a large cadre of, of folks um, who are uh, um, not only interested in genetics and genomics, but now are advising students who are interested in genetics and genomics. So if you're a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing and you're not into genetics and genomics, Eventually, a student's going to come along that you're going to advise who is going to get you into it because our students really are also pushing some of this um, advocacy. So some of the successes, the student feedback has been wonderful. And nothing is more heartwarming than having a student who has taken your class come up to you and say, you're not going to believe what I saw over at Children's Hospital today. And I actually understood what was going on. Or, you know, I was in the, the adult um, cancer risk assessment, um, you know, uh, clinic down at the Women's Hospital, and you're not going to believe it. I completely understood what they were talking about. And, you know, it, 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 it's so heartwarming to know that you participated in that. And I've had students say to me, you know, I was at Children's Hospital and I saw a child with a particular condition. I thought you made that up. It sounded so odd that it couldn't possibly be real. I said, I, you know, nature is odd enough. We don't need to make things up. And so, you know, the, the students really brought that forward and, and their feedback has been wonderful. The other thing I think is when we think about benefits to the clinical sites, our undergrad students are actually out there a lot of times educating staff nurses who did not have genetics or genomics as part of their curriculum. So the number of times that I've had students say, you know, we saw someone with this rare disease and nobody really knew what to do. And so I took them to online Mendelian inheritance in man like you told us to do. And we looked it up and we found out the clinical synopsis and, and what the gene is and, if, and then we went to see if testing was available. And what they did was they also empowered that staff nurse at the hospital to also understand a little bit more about genetics or genomics than what they did before they came on the job that day. So there is benefits. There's this whole trickle down into the clinical sites um, by having our students have this education and then bring it to the clinical sites. Um, we do now have recognition across um, campus. We have, especially in our graduate um, genetics course, we have a fair number of non-nursing students that register for our nursing genetics class. Okay, and I have to tell you, a lot of it is because we bring to the basic science piece of genetics and genomics, we bring in the clinical aspects. So we use the same textbook, okay, as the folks that are in our in, in, in the bio, who are biology majors at the University of Pittsburgh. We use the exact same textbook, but it is a completely different lecture course because we bring in the, the clinical aspects that the folks down in the, the Department of Biology are not getting. And there's just so much more of an appreciation when you bring that in. Okay. So we get a lot of folks that um, register for our, our, our course. A lot of that has to do with the fact that it's cross-listed. Okay. So what that means is the, the graduate genetics course that's offered through the School of Nursing is cross-listed and also offered through the Department of Human Genetics. So a lot of times you'll have students looking for an introductory basic genetics course at the graduate level. They'll go to the Department of Human Genetics and see, oh, I'm going to register for their course. Then they find out when they show up that it's cross-listed with this nursing course. It's great because of the diversity in student body that then shows up at this graduate course. 
Every time we offer this course, we have biostat students, epi students, rehabilitation science students, communication disorder students, dental metal medicine students, in there with our nursing students who, again, bring a broad uh, array of expertise to the table themselves. And the dialogue that you have because of the diversity and background of these students is amazing. So we really have put the word out across campus, either through cross-listing or because of word of mouth, and people are registering for the nursing um, course. Now, by allowing other, by allowing students from other disciplines on campus to come in and take this genetics class, that then allows us a little bargaining chip to say, hey, we now need your expertise to come in and guest lecture or provide a piece of this course. And we're, you know, there's a little bit of that back and forth. You know, we're supplying your students with something. Can you supply our students with something? And it really does, you know, that, you know, s scratching of the back thing that goes on a little bit. The T32 that we have now, this is for pre-doc students as well as post-doc fellows. And while that's not really why what we're here to talk about, I can't say enough about how you need to also give some thought to bringing on some resources into your school that can show, that can, can be an exemplar of how your school is moving forward with genetic and genomic um, integration. And one of the ways that you can do that is to bring in something like a training program, especially if you're at a research intensive um, university. All right. The resources that come along with that that benefit our undergraduate students are immense. Like I said, there's other courses that had to be developed as part of that training program that is now available to our undergraduate students. It brings in um, more students, more postdoc fellows, and as a result has actually brought in more faculty that are involved with genetics and genomics. That opens up research opportunities for our undergraduate students. A lot of our undergraduate students participate in research as a result. A fair number of them are interested in genetic and genomic research. And um, the other thing that it brings in is some of the other resources um, that the T32 brings in, like a journal club um, that we have. So we're, we're really diversifying ourselves across the curricula by offering many different things, elective and required for our students, so that our students kind of see a whole menu of things that they can do in genetics and genomics at the school. And it's not just something that they're going to get a taste of here and there. Um, so a couple of nuggets of, of, of advice. So yes, I think that you've, you've heard um, from other folks, you know, use the competencies to guide course objectives. It's wonderful that a lot of um, what has been developed and what's out there was developed with Bloom's taxonomy because it makes it very easy to integrate into your objectives, um, which is, you know, something that our school is really big on, um, is those level, you know, making sure that your Bloom's taxonomy is at the right level. Um, Incorporate clinical examples as much as possible. Like I mentioned before, this sets um, the School of Nursing course apart from any of the other genetics courses that's offered on campus. Um, and again, for nursing students, really helps bring it around to reality. If they can see how they may be able to use it in clinic or remember a clinical experience that they had and um, bring it into, into real life for them. I mentioned before, you know, undergraduate students are different from graduate students. We actually, when we first started out, thought, you know, undergrad students and graduate students need the same topics. They need the same information, so why should we put ourselves out there? Let's just have a combined course. We'll assign a dual number so that the undergrads are signing up for an undergrad number and the graduate students are signing up for a graduate number, but everybody will sit there together. And maybe we evaluate them a little bit differently depending on, on what they've registered for, but the delivery of the content will be the same. All right, because everybody needs the same topics. Well, then we started to realize exactly what's been mentioned here. It's the reciprocal of what you might think for other topics. The undergrads are coming in already with, with an appreciation of genetics and genomics, as well as actually a pretty decent foundation of some of the basics, especially when it comes to inheritance patterns and things like that. Um, and our graduate students did not have that. They either, they, they didn't have it in their nursing undergrad curriculum, they probably didn't have it in their high school curriculum, and they just didn't have the appreciation. So what we realized was, if we separated the two courses, the undergrads needed a little bit more time spent on the clinical applications, okay, 
whereas the graduate students, um, you still had the clinical applications there, but they got that qu more quickly. But you had to spend more time on some of the earlier things, um, some of the more basic things. You'd be surprised how many graduate students in, in our genetics courses have not done a Punnett square before. And if they have, it's because they sat down with their s the child that's in seventh grade and watch them do a Punnett square. So, you know, it's, it, or they don't remember doing it. So these are the issues that we were dealing with. So now we separated them f for logistical purposes and they remain separated now. Um, I can't emphasize enough, when you can use online resources, like Judy had mentioned, you don't reinvent the wheel. That's one reason. But I can't emphasize enough, if, if your job as a teacher is to make sure that you're empowering your students mm -hmm. for the future, Give them tools that are going to grow with, with the future. So if you give them a textbook, and, and, and five years from now they open that textbook, it's going to be completely out of date. It's actually quite sad. I, I keep some of my old genetics textbooks just so I can go back and, and really appreciate what's happened over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So that's not going to do it for them. If you're going to empower your students, introduce them to some of the online, ongoing, constantly updated websites and online resources so that a year from now when they encounter something you've taught them what tools to use they can go out there and that tool is actually going to be updated for them a year from now and of course make sure that they're good websites from government and educational institutions and things like that but empower your students for the future by introducing them to some of these online tools that are constantly kept up to date Bring in content experts when um, appropriate. Again, with all of the technology that we have today, this doesn't have to be someone at your, at your university. If you feel like the most appropriate person to deliver some content for your course is across the country, there are ways to bring that person in without physically bringing them in to give a lecture in your course. Take advantage of the technology. Um, Way back when, when this technology wasn't as well developed, we actually brought experts to Pittsburgh and taped them delivering lectures and then used those tape lectures for years, okay? Because what it did, did for our nursing students was it showed them how nurses were incorporating genetics into their clinical practice. We didn't have anyone who could do that on campus, on Pitt's campus. We had to bring those folks in from around the country. Nowadays, you don't even have to bring them in. Web them in. Okay, um, all kinds of technology that's available. So don't be afraid because there's experts out there to help you. So even if what you've decided at your school of nursing is that you're going to integrate throughout the curriculum, that doesn't mean that you still need to do everything because it's integrated into your particular course that you've been doing for 10 years. Bring in a content expert. Open up a little bit of time to bring that person in from outside. All right, And it doesn't always have to be a nursing colleague. All right. The other thing, the other piece of advice that I will give is something that the students have always appreciated that I've done at the beginning of every class is I have a little in the news segment. All right. And especially for um, the students who are out there reading the lay press. There's so many things about genetics out there in the lay press on a weekly basis. And so if you, if you don't read the, the lay press, Granted, your students probably are, especially undergraduate students. So to make it more real for them, you can do it in the news segment at the beginning of each of your um, classes. Helps keep it real. And I think you know one of the important pieces that you can do is sign up for the, the CDC's Public Health Genomics um, weekly update. And what they'll do for you is email to you once a week what's out there in the scientific literature as well as the lay press things that your students are probably reading, give you a little flavor for what's, um, what's been out there, give you resources to get to the actual um, scientific literature to back it up if you want to do that. But it gives you an idea of what your students might be reading and gives you an opportunity to bring it in in a very fresh way to your students. And um, that's, that's been an important piece of uh, what I've gotten feedback from my students about is that they really appreciate that. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention is um, the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing really is an advocate for evidence-based practice. And as a result, almost all of our courses have to have a component in it where students are reviewing the literature and critiquing the literature in a very 
specific way. We even have forms for students to use when they're critiquing the literature. And within the genetics course, we actually do a critique of the literature from a genetics point of view so that students can critically evaluate what's out there so that they can understand what the difference is between a meta-analysis, one of these huge reviews, um, versus something that's out there, a candidate gene association study on a hundred people that has never been replicated. So, you know, there's a lot of information out there in the literature. You can guide your students by providing them with literature to read and then discussing that literature. Um, again, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, there's advantages to getting your students out there and the, reading the literature. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, bring someone in who does feel comfortable doing that because I think showing them how you can bring evidence-based practice into genetics makes it very real clinically for them also. All right. Um, so those, those are my words of advice. Um, again, um, you have my email on the list and um, feel free to email me anytime. But also, you know, if you have questions, I think the panel will entertain them. Dr. Connolly, can you share how you differentiate the content for your graduate and your undergraduate um, course, genetics course? The, the, the topics, the weekly topics are identical. So the topics themselves are no different for the undergrad versus the graduate courses. Um, what is slightly different, now I, I will say a big difference between the two is in the graduate level course, I do cover research design. So I cover what an association study is, what a linkage study is, what a genome-wide association study is, what all of these things are, and how to, when you see it in the literature, interpret what you're seeing. Okay? That is not going to be of interest to our undergrad students. Um, it, at least I don't think it, it would be when you're teaching a class the size of, you know, we, we have now um, divided our undergraduates up so that we teach it once in the fall and once in the spring. And so we usually have about 75 students per semester, but it, they all used to be grouped together into 150 students in a large lecture hall. And so, you know, that really, you know, impedes some of what you can do. Um, and the, granted, the majority of those students would not appreciate the, the research design stuff. So some of the topics, you know, are a little bit different. But for the most part, same topics. We just go into them in a little bit different depth. And I will say, at the undergrad as well, uh, undergrad as well as the graduate level, I never hold students to the clinical presentation of disease. And this is because my philosophy has always been, if you can look it up, I don't want you committing it to memory. I'd rather you develop a basic understanding, understand genetics from a conceptual point of view so that you can critically think about the situation. You can always look up what the clinical presentation of something is. And the week after you take an exam, you're probably never going to remember what that clinical presentation was anyway. You're not going to trust yourself, so you're going to look it up. A lot of genetic conditions, especially when you're talking about the monogenic conditions, are rare enough that you probably won't trust yourself to what you learned a year ago, two years ago, because you haven't seen it since then. So you're going to want to look it up. But um, when it comes to the clinical presentation and bringing it to the clinical phenomenon, um, we do that a, a little bit less in the graduate course, a little bit more in the undergraduate course, because our students haven't been out there and done as much clinical at the undergraduate level, whereas, you know, when you're, when you're teaching the graduate students and you're bringing up something um, that's clinically relevant, some, some testing, for example, they'll all be shaking their heads, they've heard about it, you know, and so you feel like you probably don't need to go as in-depth with the clinical present, you know, the, the clinical applicability of that particular topic, but then you find yourself um, needing to actually go into more depth about the um, conceptualization of that test, um, what's actually done when they do that genetic testing, um, that sort of thing. And then I will say, um, we do have um, ethical, legal, and social um, implications um, within the undergrad and graduate course. However, that is something, you know, again, that, that has been 
um, integrated throughout the curriculum. And we do have a standalone ethics course. We do have a standalone um, health promotion course. And both of those courses have one day set aside for genetic and genomic testing and uh, family dynamics associated with that and all of the implications that go um, forward. So, um, and that's different, that's also different at the undergrad and the, and the graduate level, the, the case presentation. The extent to which you go in those case into those case presentations. So, again, most of the topics are identical. It's just how in depth clinically versus how in depth um, basic science you go it is is usually a little bit different between the undergrad and the graduates. And then the evaluation of their knowledge is completely different, um, especially when you're talking about a large undergrad class versus a, a class of 30 graduate students, um, where you can do get a lot more creative in how you evaluate them. On the traditional um, or the standalone courses, are they offered uh, in a traditional way, face-to-face um, -face lecture, and or is part of it online, or is the whole course online? This sort of both. I, you know. The course yeah. that I taught was totally online um, because, first of all, that's what what I wanted to do, and second of all, I really believe for the RN student who's working full time who has family responsibilities full time, many of whom in this day and age are the sole support for their families because their husbands aren't working or their wives aren't working. And, you know, just to be able to have the flexibility of being able to schedule when they're going to learn, I felt that, I mean, for me that was very important to be sure that the students had as much control as possible as, you know, using principles of adult learning. Could I have taught it face to face? Yes, but I really believe that online learning is more rigorous I believe that you can't sit in the back of the room and be the quiet one. Everyone has to have a voice. Every, you can't be the one in the front of the room who's monopolizing the teacher. Everyone has the opportunity and the responsibility to participate. And I really feel that an online course um, enhances learning in a way that uh, a face-to-face -face course doesn't. The three courses that I mentioned are also online. They're, they're offered through our Center for Credit Programs. and so the the human genetics courses online. Topics are covered on a weekly basis and there are assignments. Uh, same way with the advanced practice course. Usually that's a discussion topic with an asynchronous discussion uh, opportunity. At our university, people can sign up for as many as three courses without being enrolled in the university. And that's been in place for a long time. And many, many nurses have taken courses for professional advancement, for example, under that uh, format. So that's how these courses are offered as well. And um, for us at the University of Pittsburgh, they are traditional face-to-face. -face. Um, they are web-assisted. So, you know, like a lot of the, the lectures are available online. You know, the lectures that I talked about that we recorded um, from the experts, those are available on demand um, through the web assist. However, the University of Pittsburgh took a very strong stand against online um, teaching, and only this semester opened up online teaching as a possibility for our faculty for a course that was 100% online. Only this semester are we, this is the first time that they've allowed us to do that. So um, it has always been face to face, and but some of that decision was made for us by the university. Can you tell me what uh, the rationale was for being so strongly against uh, online at the University of Pittsburgh? I, I, I won't pretend to understand exactly <laughs> how uh, the upper administration at the university works. Um, however, um, their big stand was um, the caliber of teaching that they felt students got online versus that, that there were, you could hide a lot of poor teachers. In, on, in, in online courses. And so we needed face-to-face, -face, well, and I disagree with that, and I think that it's a lot of work to do online courses, um, and it's a lot of time. However, um, th that was their stand, that they did not want online courses available, that if somebody wanted that, they could go elsewhere to get it. And Pitt has taken this stance on many things. Um, you can go elsewhere to get it. We are not going to be everything to everybody. All right, so then we fast forward to this 
semester. And um, because we are, you know, nobody wants to think of a university as a business. Um, but when your some of your business starts getting taken away, you start to change a little bit. So um, while I um, always disagreed with them about their stance on online, um, it, they weren't supporting it. And without the infrastructure to do online courses. You just can't do it. So they had our hands tied. But that, that has changed now. Um, but again, I do not claim to understand the, the workings of the upper administration. And I completely disagree with a lot of the things that they, they originally used as rationale for not doing it. Well, you know, one of the challenges I've had with online teaching, uh, and I've been doing it now for 10 years in various and sundry ways. Uh, is the philosophy that um, you can create the course online and then I've been assigned as many as 60 and 70 students in an online course, in which case I've sectioned the course and I've basically taught six sections because that's what you needed in that particular course is, you know, educating people and in our administration we have some of the issues that we, you know, my successor in the role of Director of Information Technology has presented the administration with evidence as to the optimal size for online teaching. Well, it's like, that's not necessarily, you know, you're just not teaching it right. But really, the evidence says that once you get beyond about 25, it's very difficult to have the kind of interactivity that you need in an online course. So the same as we have to educate people about genetics and genomics, sometimes we have to educate folks about teaching strategies. and. You know, there's lots of battles you can choose to fight. Okay, we have reached the 3 p.m. point, which is the close of the webinar. Thank you for those of you who have joined in the webinar process, and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. And for those of you in the room, it's break time for 15 minutes. <laughs>